Hey, I'm Sam. Welcome to Brickwall Pictures. Today I am doing a Yorgos Lanthimos tier list. I have previously done a tier list for a whole bunch of filmmakers, so check the description for a link to that playlist. Also, if you want to hear my thoughts on more movies, you can follow me on Letterboxd. My, uh, my at is down there too. Yorgos Lanthimos doesn't have as many films as a bunch of the other tier lists I've done. He's only got five feature films here, but we're going to talk about all of them. Uh, he's a filmmaker I love. I think his style is incredible and utterly unique. You can see just from the posters how unified they all look. Like, he has a very defined style that is unique to him. And that's something I value in a filmmaker. We're going to start off here with uh, the film that uh, really rocketed into rock star director status in the U.S. or in uh, like English-speaking uh, countries because his first couple of films didn't break out quite as much. The Lobster, I love how big of a movie The Lobster ended up being because it's so odd that it feels very much like the kind of movie that would fly completely under the radar with general audiences, but it's somehow connected with way more people than a movie like The Lobster usually does. And I think that's a great thing. It is deliciously weird. It is pitch black humor executed very well. I think it's a very, very funny movie. Um, but Yorgos Lanthimos' humor, uh, at least in this one and in Killing of a Sacred Deer, it's more overt in the favorite, I guess because, you know, different writer, Lobster and Sacred Deer. It's the kind of like pitch black humor that I think someone could watch it and not even realize it was supposed to be funny. They would just be like disturbed because his movies have this eerie, creepy, uncomfortable, disturbing quality to them that I think is part of his unique charm. But they also have this really dark humor and I think The Lobster is hilarious. Well, so the movie is very clearly divided into two halves. There's the first half and then there's the second half. First half is in uh, like the hotel and whatnot. It's got all these, you know, the rules and everything's all established. And the second half is out in the woods and it's almost like rebels, like almost like guerrilla warfare kind of thing, except in a very, very skewed um, interpretation of that dynamic. As a lot of people have rightly pointed out, the first half is stronger than the second half. It's much more enjoyable. I think the second half still has a lot going for it. still has a lot going on. I love that a Nick Cave song is like so pivotal to the plot. Just, I just love Nick Cave in general. Colin Farrell is like perfectly cast in this. He's very funny. Joan C. Riley is really good. Olivia Colman is great. Um, obviously, she got her big Oscar win for The Favorite, but they worked together earlier in The Lobster, which is really good here as well. All around, good movie. Second half is a little bit weaker. If the second half was as strong as the first half, this would be an easy S tier movie, I think. Second half being weaker, it's like low A or high B. Low A, I think, is where I want to put it. Low A. Uh, maybe not. Maybe high B. I think I want to go high B. It's a high B. Next up is The Killing of a Sacred Deer. This one, unfortunately, didn't get nearly as much attention as The Lobster did, but then The Favorite did again, so it's kind of like it got missed somehow. It's kind of like how people seem to miss Denny Villeneuve's uh, enemy in between Prisoners and Arrival, or between Prisoners and Sicario. Somehow, enemy just kind of missed audiences. Killing of a Sacred Deer kind of did the same thing. And I think people also just like, like it a little bit less. I, I don't agree with that sentiment at all. I, I love Killing of a Sacred Deer. I think it's phenomenal. Again, it's, uh, it's even more disturbing than The Lobster. The Killing of a Sacred Deer, I think you could categorize as a horror film and you wouldn't be off base. That being said though, it's still, it does still have plenty of like pitch black humor. Uh, very disturbing. Again, utterly unique. The concept is like almost nonsensical, but it works because of how committed to the strangeness it is. I don't know if it's quite surreal. It's almost surreal. I mean, part of Lanthimos' style is this purposely stilted dialogue and performances. And he swears he doesn't tell the actors to, you know, he doesn't direct them to perform that way. They just kind of do based on the material. I don't know if I necessarily believe that. It might be like a case of the his previous work informing the current work, you know. The performances are all great, though. Again, Colin Farrell, excellent. Um, Nicole Kidman is great in it, and fucking Barry Keoghan steals the fucking show. He's so good. Every time I see him in a movie, I watch very carefully to find out whether or not he eats spaghetti in that one or not. Most of the time, he doesn't eat spaghetti in his other movies. Occasionally, though, he does eat spaghetti in another movie. Um, also, the other, or one of the kids is Sonny Suljic. He was in uh, Jonah Hill's movie, Mid-90s, and he was great in that. He's also the voice of uh, Atreus in uh, God of War, the like rebooted God of War. Good actor, good uh, talented young actor. Tell me about Sacred Deer. I like uh, I like it a whole lot. I think I like it even more than The Lobster. It's not quite S, but it's A tier. 
Love how bizarre it is. Okay, next up is Alps. If not as many people saw Killing of a Sacred Deer, then even fewer people saw, saw Alps. Um, Alps was right after Dogtooth, I believe. Um, Dogtooth, again, I think mainstream audiences never saw Dogtooth, but the cinephile crowd all found Dogtooth. I don't think they found Alps, or at least they don't talk about it as much. There's kind of a good reason for that. Alps is definitely a whole lot less interesting than Dogtooth. Alps, again, takes a bizarre concept, and I really like the concept. The premise is basically this group of people kind of run a business where they, like, impersonate the deceased loved ones of their clients as, like, a radical approach to treating uh, the grieving process. It's very interesting. And it has a very similar style to Dogtooth, partly because this is while he was still making movies back in uh, back in Greece, where Yorgos is from. Same co-writer as uh, Dogtooth, by the way. Um, I have no idea how to pronounce her name, so I will try. Maybe I will try. It's something like F, 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 no, I won't try. <laughs> it's interesting, but it, it doesn't quite fire on all the cylinders that uh, Dogtooth and the other ones do. Um, I actually think it's quite a bit weaker. I don't think it's bad, um, but I'm going to put it in D because it's a big step down from The Lobster. And next up we have The Favorite, which is definitely his most seen movie by far. Um, Oscar winner, of course. I'd love to see Olivia Colman finally getting recognition. This is the, the part, oddly enough, that finally made her like a huge star. Um, I've been a fan of her just since the Peep Show days, back when she was a... Uh, purely working in comedy, at least for the most part, with like David Mitchell and Robert Webb back when she was like playing second fiddle to those guys. Love seeing her get all this attention. Check out my um, Tyrannosaur video essay for a deep dive into her performance in that. Rachel Weisz and Emma Stone are both like equally good. Um, it's really odd to me that Olivia Coleman was in the best leading category, while Rachel Weisz and Emma Stone were both in supporting. I think that's backwards. I think Olivia Coleman is like, her character is the supporting character to the two leads that are Rachel Weisz and Emma Stone. I don't know why they do that sometimes. I think it's some, like, gerrymandering that they do for Oscar categories sometimes based on, like, which one they think they're more likely to win, you know? Yeah, all three of them are great. Uh, Nick Holt is also really good. Um, I, I think he's a talented actor. He always impresses me. Oh, and also he's in The Great as well, if you haven't seen that TV show. Um, I think it's a Hulu original. It's from the same writer as The Great, and if you pay close enough attention, you'll even notice they shoot in some of the same locations, like that really long, um, like, opulent hall that they walk up and down over and over again in both The, the Great and The Favorite. It's the same, like, hallway. So, I mean, because, you know, there's only so many massive, opulent, uh, palaces that are still erected that you don't have to build, so obviously they're going to shoot in the same places. But it's a very similar sense of humor to both of those as well. Um, I recommend The Great. I, I'm still like working my way through the first season because I'm kind of slow about watching TV, but it, it's good. The favorite is great. Um, I don't think I would quite go S tier with it, but I will go A tier. And lastly, we have Dogtooth. Now, Dogtooth is, is a tricky one. It's to be honest, it's kind of a hard watch. I saw this for the first time as like a freshman in high school. It like it like shook my system. It was like it was like the weirdest thing I had ever seen. This movie at that point in time. Now I've seen weirder stuff, of course, but at that point I'd never seen something so fucking bizarre <laughs> as Dog Tooth at, at that point in my life. And to the point where it took me several days to process just my basic, the most basic feelings I had towards the movie, whether I liked it or didn't like it. And it actually wasn't that, it was it was whether I hated it or whether I absolutely loved it. And I could not tell. It took me days of thinking about the movie and I couldn't stop thinking about it. It was just like completely rattled my cage, man. <laughs> it was like, this is either one of the best things I've ever seen or one of the worst things I've ever seen. And I could not tell which. And I ended up landing on the side of, yeah, it's really fucking good. I believe it is a commentary on homeschooling. First and foremost, at least that's my interpretation. This is definitely a movie that you can interpret in a few different ways. Um, that's what I get most clearly from it. I think there are like several ways you can interpret it. You could probably interpret it along the lines of like a, uh, it's like a fascist kind of commentary or something, you know, I'm sure there's different ways to take it. I think it's a fascinating movie, but it is kind of a hard watch. The violence is so brutal in this movie. There's honestly like not that much violence, but just the way it's executed, like, oh, it's, it's, it's hard to watch the screen. Because it's, it's just shown in such a stark, unflashy, realistic way. Cringeworthy violence. Really hard to watch. Like when she's slamming a, a dumbbell into her own like mouth. 
horrible when the guy tapes a VHS tape to his hand and he's smacking them around. It's like, that, that's not really all that violent, smacking someone with a VHS tape, but it's the way it's shot in this really like, pulled back, wide shot, you just see this hard impact, and it's like the actors look like they're suffering. Now, the, when it comes to the performances, they're they're kind of hard to, to gauge because of Yorgos' style, where it's like, there, no, there's no attempt toward realism, um, or, or like naturalism, so to speak, um, except I guess for the favorite, but even then to a degree. Like, he has this very stilted on purpose style, where it's like, it creates such an atmosphere in this like otherworldly tone to his movies that's like oppressive. And I think in something he does in Dog Tooth that he he does a little bit in the Alps, but then he kind of stopped doing once he got to the Lobster onward. Uh, Dog Tooth is shot in this way that is constantly severing the actors. So many shots chop the actors off, and it's from like the neck down, or they'll only be like, you know half in frame like this, or the shot will be like of them like this, talking, delivering important dialogue, but you only see it from the neck down. It's a fascinating choice in a visual style that, I mean, you know, occasionally you'll see a shot like that, but so rarely is there a whole film committed to a style like that. That was part of why, um, what made it so hard for me to process on a first watch. But now looking back, it's one of the things I admire the most about it, because it's so effective. It's alienating. It speaks volumes to the like themes of the film, and it just creates this utterly unique sense of atmosphere and like impending doom of like dread. I, lo I love how it's shot. I kind of would like to see him revisit that style in the future, and because I mean he, he's obviously like continued to develop as a filmmaker over all these years. Yeah, Dog Tooth. I cannot recommend as broadly as his other movies because it's so intense. Like the violence. Also, there's like really graphic uh, sex in the movie too. So if, if that'll, that might be an impediment for some viewers. That and the, the, and the extremely brutal violence are both like impediments that stop me from recommending it as widely as say The Lobster or The Favorite. The Favorite definitely is most accessible, which is why it makes sense that it is one that got all the awards tension and hit the widest audience because it's way more accessible than Dogtooth. Honestly, The Favorite and Dogtooth are on like polar ends of the spectrum when it comes to audience accessibility. In terms of like mainstream viewers. The favorite I could recommend to like absolutely everybody. Dogtooth is for a very specific crowd, like a hardcore cinephile crowd um, that likes, you, you gotta be into like artsy movies. I think it's great though. I don't know, I don't necessarily think it's like way better than The Favorite um, or A Killing of a Sacred Deer. I think it's just extremely different. I think I'm gonna leave it an A as well, which means you don't have an S tier, but hey, that's fine. You don't always need an S tier. Three A tier films makes for a fucking A plus filmmaker in my book. Um, Alps is the only one that doesn't fire on all cylinders, but the other one's all up top here, yeah. Big fan of uh, Yorgos. Looking forward to whatever he does next. I got more tier lists you can check out in the description, and I got more coming up in the future. So subscribe, stick around. I'll see you next time. Bye.